Welcome to Fridays with a Forester. This is March 8th, 2024. Recreational trail design for woodland owners is our topic today. We thank you for joining us. Again, uh, a host today are myself, Gary Wyatt, extension educator on our forestry team and based out of the Mankato Regional Office, and also Lauren Backus, and she's our regional support staff at Andover and a very good monitor of our, our web series. And thank you, Lauren. So today's topic speaker and is recreational trail design for woodland owners and given by Angela Gupta. She's our extension forester and professor, extension professor at the University of Minnesota Extension Rochester office. It's a regional office in Rochester. And we thank you for presenting Angie. Our Zoom details here as the Q&A. So if you have question, uh, questions of the day's uh, type webinar, you can uh, deliver them in, in the Q&A uh, portion of the Zoom here. Again, all of our webinars are recorded at z.umn.edu slash Fridays. And Angie, I'm gonna stop sharing and you can start sharing. Uh, great, so I'm excited to talk to you guys today about recreational trail design for woodland stewards. And I just want to say I am not the or uh, the originator of much of this content. So um, former, uh, now Professor Emeritus Mel Ballman, uh, he developed uh, all of this, pretty much all of this content and went on sabbatical and really studied recreational trail design for woodland stewards and, and private woodland owners. Um, and so I have, he was kind enough when he retired to leave all of our materials. And it was actually when I was reviewing some feedback we got for some of our woodland owners and stewards that I realized that this is a topic that people are still really interested in that we hadn't taught in a number of years since Mel had retired. So I, I revived it and, um, and I'm, I'm excited. So I think, I think it'll be good. Uh, I, so, you know, this is only like the first part of a journey of recreational trail design. And I'm, I'm uh, moderately optimistic that Gary will invite me back to talk about like part two next year, which the timing will work well for that. Uh, the other thing I just want to say is that many of the pictures are Mel Bauman's pictures. He was really a great photographer. So um, the ones that do not have photo captions, those are all attributed to Mel. All right, so let's get started. So let's... There we go. So first, we're going to talk in more detail about um, decide trail users, select the corridor, establish design standards, and mark trail locations. Only I'm only going to overview sort of the briefest overview at the very end of the presentation, trail design, location, clearing, tread, construction, structure, installation and wayfinding. And the reason for that is one, it's way too much content to cover in, you know, 30 minutes to an hour with Q&A. Um, but I also think it is important to spend some time thinking about these first four steps. And really, the recommendation is a whole year with all four seasons um, before then you actually start doing some of these latter things. And so I think it's OK to, to divide it out this way. Um, I will offer right now and then at the end resources that you can use if you want to take a deeper peek at these things moving forward. So with that, the very first resource, um, if you are not familiar with the Woodland Stewardship, a Practical Guide for Midwest Landowners, the third edition, this is free, um, available publicly online. It's a web resource at this point. Um, there, there may be hard copies available, but I suspect most people just access it through the web. Um, and chapter... 14, so you can only see one through four on the left navigation because that's all I could screen capture. But if you were to scroll down, chapter 14 is recreational trail design. And you can see Mel Baum and Terry Sears were the, the authors of that. So it's a really great resource. It's um, much simpler than the DNR resource that I'll tell you at the end because it's really geared towards woodland owners and not professional professional recreational trail design. So I think that's the big and important difference. Um, also, several of my schematics come directly from this, this resource. And so I believe that Lauren will drop in the links that I referenced. There's only, I think, four, um, either as I go or at the end. So you don't have to like scramble to, to take notes here. All right. And then I want to give a shout out. So this is the Lost Creek Hiking Trail. It's a hiking trail of Chatfield, Minnesota. Um, that is down here in uh, southeast of Minnesota. And it is entirely on private land. So it is a public 
publicly accessible trail, but it's entirely on private land and it's entirely developed and administered by uh, the private woodland owners and stewards. And then they work in conjunction with the local hiking club. But it is a really unique uh, opportunity for woodland owners to potentially drive down and totally legitimately and above board walk through private property to see how they have sort of solved some tricky things when it comes to trail designation, a trail design, trail um, paths, all that kind of thing that we'll talk about today. And so um, it, it was for a long time unidirectional. So you had to put in at one point and you had to get out um, many miles later. They now have a small loop to make it a little bit more accessible that way. Uh, and so I want to say, again, this is totally above board. The trail runs across private land. So please respect landowners uh, by following the rules posted on the signs. And uh, and they do, you know, if you read a little bit further on their website, which I have linked it here, linked at the bottom, um, they talk about like dogs and farm, working farms and livestock and how they sort of did those. Having been on it, um, I will say they also have some really interesting and unique features that they needed to, um, obstacles to overcome. So creek crossings, I have some interesting way of doing that. They have a blowhole. That's an interesting geologic feature of the karst geology we have down here in Southeast Minnesota. They walk through many different types of forests um, and, and other you know, ag land and whatnot. So it's a real mix of things and they have some creative solutions to some of these common problems. All right, so to really get started, the very, very first thing you wanna do is figure out who you want to use the trail. And, you know, if you are the owner of the property or you are the most likely user of the property, this might be super simple, um, but it also can be useful to think like um, on the picture on the left, are you are you mostly hoping to, to bird watch or do some of these more passive recreational activities, but is mobility an issue, right? Like, um, do you need to think about that differently? Do you need to worry about aging as you go? Are you really a winter sport enthusiast? And if so, I am so sorry about this past winter. Um, but if so, then you need to be, you have a different series of considerations. And for cross-country skiing, of course, rate turn radius and slope really matter a lot. So you need to think about those a little differently. Are you hoping the grandkids will bike on the property? Um, that takes a different type of trail. It, again, takes different curve, rate, curve radiuses, slope considerations, um, and surfaces. And the other thing is that, you know, are you really a snowmobiler or a four-wheeler? Because that requires something different. And so um, this is really important and it will influence many other things of other decisions that you you make. And so, you know, it might not be just who's going to use it, but what are they hoping to do on it? So are you trying to get to the fishing hole or the wide pot, the swimming hole in the creek? Are you trying to really have access to the great deer habitat because you know that that you're primarily going to use these trails in the fall or as you prepare for deer season? Um, are there other management you're doing? I mean, this is a walnut plantation. Are you trying to protect that other management but still need to get through those trails? And so, or are you trying to use your trails to access the woodland management that you're doing? So again, lots of things to consider as you figure out who your target audience is and what your goals are. You need to be, be really cognizant of the number of anticipated users and when they will be using it. So uh, having a group of people using it multiple times a week or even uh, daily can have really different impacts and require different considerations than if it's just you on summer weekends, you know, seven times a summer. Um, those are really different levels. And so they require greater thought and care if you're going to have more people on it more consistently. And, and even if it's just more people once or twice a year, right? If it's when you're all out prepping for deer season and then you're all out for the week of deer season or you're all out for archery, you know, or you, if you have these big family events that you always do at the property, then and that's when the trail is going to get used, you might have different considerations um, than it's just you and your spouse or just you by yourself and you just want to bird watch. So the type of user experience is also really important and it can often but not always um, really span the scope of resource allocation too. So for example, if you are really keen on a natural look and feeling very um, part of the forested ecosystem or the woodlands that you're in, then you might, uh, you, you're gonna do things differently. If you're really worried about having, you don't wanna have ticks and you're gonna be really careful about wild parsnip and poison ivy and some of these other things and you wanna make sure that there's a good wide clearing radius or you can walk with loved ones and hold hands for whatever reason, sight issues or small children or 
you just like your loved ones, you're going to have different considerations. And, if, and again, if this, this trail on the right, I suspect is a public trail, not a private trail, but if your passion is, you know, really biking or it is, um, it is cross country skiing to the point that you wear, you use the roller skis in the summer, right? You're going to need different trail considerations and they're, they are likely all possible, um, but they do have, they impact the rest of your decisions and quite probably your finances. So you got to select a corridor and often we're going to talk, there's a schematic coming up shortly, but you need to figure out which swath of land with it, um, which will is where the trail will be built. And there can often be some pretty significant landscape features that will help define that for you. So here in Southeast Minnesota in bluff country, the, the bluffs and the, the hilly terrain and topography can be very influential on where we can reasonably pick to put in recreational trail designs. Up north when it's the land of pogs, uh, bogs and marshes and um, lakes, it may be, you know, where can you cross the landscape and avoid wet areas and water? And so you might be really limited by these um, features, but that's going to be the first thing that you're going to look at after you define your users. And so there are a number of tools. Um, Google images have really just gotten super great. So I use the Lost Creek hiking trail to just zoom in on areas. And so this is a Google image captured from about a week and a half ago. It's quite good, frankly, um, that you could start sort of assessing. The DNR also has their land view data. And so this, again, it's pretty good. This is a, the land view map on the right is from 2000. So it's not super new. I'm sure the Google data, the Google image is newer. But both can help you see the topography, the oxbows in the river. Um, they can, you know, you can really see where the fields are versus the woodland. So these can be useful attributes. Of course, um, we're going to talk about a topo map. So you can uh, get topo maps free online. The one on the right is what you'll see. And then I zoomed into this Lost Creek area. And you can really start to see the steepness of those slopes in a way you can't always from an aerial photo. Uh, that matters when you're going to talk about trail steepness, um, slopes, and then you need to talk about your turning radius, all of those things are going to matter a lot. So these are some of those foundational documents that can help you suss out where it might be reasonable to consider putting these trails. And so this is what we're, we're really gaming towards, right? So you're trying to, to do this inventory of what's already on the property and what the limitations and the opportunities are. And so some other things you certainly want to be sure you inventory are what are the existing roads uh, and that can be all kinds of roads whether it's wood roads or you know driveways it can what what if any trails are already on the property and so I think commonly we think of trails as like trails we made but you might want to follow game trails see if they lead um, if those are good routes then of course a control point so those are any sort of points of limitation um, or, or points that are going to you're going to have to really think about so like River crossings are common control points. So you have to funnel through those typically. Obstacles, so is there anything you can't go through or around? And that might be ponds or swamps. A lot of wetlands um, fall into that category. So you're gonna need to make sure you find those. Points of interest are places you might want to go to, right? So those are destination places. And so, you know, are there great views? Are there um, great wildlife watching? Is there a great unique feature or plant or um, structure that you want that, that, is, that is worth the effort to get to, right? Um, that is different than anchor points. So anchor points are small, often natural features of interest that you want to sort of um, have scattered along your trail. And I think about those as places where I might want to pull over and just take a drink from my water bottle. I may not sit down, I may not need a bench, but they're just places that are of enough interest that I'll pause, I'll look, I'll comment, I'll wait for a small child to catch up, kind of like that. All right. Um, also, you want to scout in all seasons. So a lot of people think about trail design in the summer. That's when lots of trails are in, in their their most used. But the truth of the matter, we need to think about in all seasons um, because we need to understand the risks and the opportunities in multiple seasons. And so um, also it's important to know, you know, what are the natural features of those? And then what season, again, have you, hopefully you've already defined this, but what season are you most keen to use it? And are you really never going to use it in those other seasons? Like, does it 
really not matter? Um, and so things that you might be looking for, you know, are there really interesting plants that will only be visible during the growing season, herbaceous layer that are, there are woodies that are going to be pretty obscure in the landscape. Are there any features in the winter? So I really think about cross-country skiing here, right? So, um, you know, it can be really stressful to ski down a slope too quickly and have to make a turn at the end if you're cross-country skiing. And you don't want people running into big trees, right? So you need to really manage that closely. Different than if you're a snowshoer, uh, right? You can sort of meander back and forth. You don't know those big turn radiuses on snowshoes. So it's just, you know, same season, different sport makes a big difference. Are there any beautiful spring ephemerals that you really don't want to miss in the spring when you're anxious to get out there? Or are fall colors really what you groove on? And so you want to make sure you have the best views of the great hardwoods for your fall, fall color points of interest. And so, um, you know, I started out with this is only the beginning and I think you should take a year. This is why, because I do think, you know, you might go out and flag it now, but then you want to revisit that multiple times throughout the year. So what are existing uh, travel ways already on the property? And so in, in bluff country, we do see these on these bluff um, edges. That's, that's fairly common. Are there old road or skid trails? Are there these buffers between landscape types? That is fairly common. I have another picture where it is it is quite clearly the fire buffer is the trail. And those are good multi-use ways of thinking about it. So, um, you know, even if those like old logging or skid trails haven't been used in a number of years, is it worth revitalizing them for your trail? And that's something to consider. So I mentioned points of interest. So these are destination points. These are places that you're going to make an effort to get to. And they can be lots of different things. So again, down in Bluff Country, we have a lot of interesting geology. So it could be an interesting rock formation, a small cave, an overhang, something like that. It certainly could be a beautiful stand of big trees, right? Um, it doesn't have to be acres and acres and acres, you know, just a, a quarter acre of really big trees can definitely be worth the energy to get there. Um, of course, beautiful, view, beautiful viewscapes um, are often points of interest. Now, you may have to manage the vegetation to maintain the beautiful viewscape, so that's something to consider. But if you're the woodland owner or the primary woodland steward, then you have the, the ability to make those decisions. Um, is it a beautiful creek? Like I said, is it somewhere you can relax in the summer? Um, any of those things. So you want to figure out where those might be and then if you can reasonably access them. Uh, there also are times when you might want to avoid features like that. And I think I have a slide coming about that. There are different habitat types. So you, if you're woodland stewards, you know this, you know, there's different types of forests, there's conifer, hardwood, and within those, there's many, many different native plant communities. Um, there are prairies, there are ag lands, there are wildlife habitat improvement projects, so ponds or uh, food plots for deer, all kinds of different things. And it can often be really enjoyable to hike through those different ecosystems. They kind of break up the hike, they break up the monotony of a single system. Um, but then they also offer the most wildlife viewing in those different habitat types. And of course, edges tend to be places where wildlife um, use different resources across the landscape. And so it can be little things like where are there lots of bird cong congregating or nesting, um, where are the holes, often these are started like by pileators, and then many other things will move into these big holes and trees. Do you have really big uh, animals like moose, many, most woodland owners cannot, cannot claim to have many moose on their property. But if you do have things like that, or there's an area where deer commonly congregate, um, might you want to pass through those things? So, you know, again, things to consider as you're out there. You, of course, as the woodland owner, you can do things that will attract wildlife, right? So um, are there opportunities on what, it, what it, as it starts to settle out, what your best routes are through your woods to do these recreational trails? Can you then add features to increase the some of these attributes along the trail edge to increase um, access and uh, and the entertainment value. So of course we know you can do nesting plots, you can absolutely do food plots for deer, um, you can certainly do uh, down woody debris or, or brush piles that can be really great for small mammals, even reptiles and amphibians. And so, you know, maybe some of these will be the outcome of other management you're doing. So it's common that food plots will be put on to log landings once the logging is done. I'll tell you, I do a lot of invasive species work and there's a ton of downwoody material that tends to hit the ground when you remove buckthorn or honeysuckle or 
um, lots of other invasive shrubs. And so can you retain some of those intentionally for wildlife value? So again, even if your trail doesn't go by those naturally, can you add them? Maybe. So these are cultural resources. And I said, there are some things you might wanna go to and there's some things you might wanna avoid. And cultural resources um, can be in both. And so it is not uncommon in the woods to find old chimneys or old um, home foundations left by the settlers when they, they moved out. And so those can be both attributes you wanna visit or they can be places you don't wanna go. And so in public lands, um, it's common that you wouldn't want people to go there because they become vandalized. Um, it, it can be the same with rare plants, right? And so it is quite common that public agencies will very intentionally avoid places that have rare plants or other threatened and endangered species um, because I do not want people going to them and knowing about them. But if this is just for you and your immediate family and you're confident everyone are good resource managers and they're gonna be respectful of these resources, then maybe those are highlights. But you should think about that. So of course I have the chimney here and it is not uncommon to find graves, individual or small graveyards in the woods. And so again, go there, don't go there. Um, and this on the left is an Indian mound. Uh, so many people might not recognize it, um, but it, it may, if, if you know it is there and that is a, of interest, then you might want to go there. If you would prefer to avoid it, then, then you should avoid it. So again, I mentioned these anchor points, so they draw attention to natural objects. So the idea is to sort of run your trail near them. Um, and so here's an example of just a stone and a big tree. And these are the points that I think of as like where I would pull over and take a sip of my water or wait for a kid to catch up. Um, and they don't, you don't necessarily need to add them, but you could, right? Like um, if you wanted to add a bird feeder or a bird box or not, probably not a feeder, a box, if you wanted to add um, a brush pile. So these, these could act as, a, as anchor points. All right, switching gears and going to the step three, establish design standards. So there's a whole lot going on in here um, and I'm not gonna go through all of these in a ton of detail but you have to think about trail configuration. So that overall kind of map of the trail, overall trail length, tread service, surface and tread width. And we'll talk about those two things, clearing width and how that's different and why it matters, clearing height. I think that'll be obvious, but we'll talk about it. Grade, this can be super important for many trails, turning radius, sight distances and water crossings. So here is an example from that um, Woodland Stewardship book online of, of what you might be looking at. So um, and here's an example of a linear trail. You've got some simple loop trails and some cutoff trails. And of course, the idea here is that many users like to pick their distance. Um, and sometimes, you know, you, you have more energy or more time. So you're going to go the full length of all of the big, robust um, trails. And other days, you just have time or energy for a small loop. Linear trails, I, I find to be a bit tricky because I don't end up where I started, right? So something to consider, but they may absolutely be worth it to get to a point of specific interest. So trail width. So this is the width of the trail where you're going to trod. And so here you can see this planked, very obvious and clear. Um, and then I guess, I'm sorry, this is the total width that you're gonna need. And, and then um, on the right, you can see you have the tread and then you have a lot of, there's very little brush or, or branches in the way. And so we're gonna talk about those. Um, but of course this matters, right? So depending upon what surfaces you need in order to go where you wanna go and what uses you have will influence how big and wide these, these are. So clearing width. So first you, clearance is beyond just the tread. So the tread is that part that you walk on. Um, and so that's the part that I think many people think of as the trail. And you can see on the, the picture on the left, um, there's the tread. It's actually lined with sticks, which is kind of fun. It's very clear of debris. It's very obvious. And then you can see there aren't um, a lot of sticks or brush that are going to hit you when you walk through there. You, you compare that to the trail on the right where you have the tread, but there's no clearance beyond that. So you might, your elbows might hit the brush. You might not be able to walk side by side. Um, and so these are things that, that you should be thinking about and the total clearance width is that larger area. So the height, 
So the height um, may not be an issue, uh, but it could be. So down here in Southeast where we do have a lot of topography, we do have places where you can cut through stone, um, but that of course may be hard to do. So the picture on the left is, is it the, the, the decision might be, is it tall enough to reasonably run people through? Or is it just a site of interest where people can pop in there and look through and take a picture, but they're not actually going to tra traverse. On the right, they top right, they actually, you can see the trail designers cut out um, a little section of that big stone in order to increase the trail height. I, I don't know how many woodland owners are gonna have the resource to do that, but, but maybe. Um, and more commonly, I think for most woodland owners is you're gonna have to figure out how tall up you wanna trim the trees in order to safely get people through there. Uh, and so, you know, there are sort of standard trail heights, um, but if you are a family of very large people, you may wanna go above and beyond the, the, the standards. Setbacks from waterways, we are the land of more than 10,000 lakes and many, many rivers. And so water is everywhere. Um, and there are, there are good things you can do and there are not so good things you can do, right? Um, but you always have to consider it. And so the picture on the left is just an example of they were just too close. They did a lot of things to try to buffer that edge, but it, it may not work out well for them. Um, on the right, they did some different things to buffer the edge. Uh, and you can see this much larger stone uh, getting really kin to riprap there. Um, now I wanna say, I think in both examples, these are on a slope, right? This is, this is commonly the case. And so if you wanna navigate through here and the water is your point of interest, then you're going to figure out, you're going to need to figure out how to um, navigate through these obstacles um, or around or near to get to your points of interest. So these are really common scenarios which might take um, thought as you as you get started. And it might well be worth looking at some of the resources that I provided and then I'll provide at the end from the DNR. Like how did other people solve these things and are they applicable to your property? So site distances, um, pros and cons to this, right? So this is probably an extreme example on the left where they carved out through the soil and the site distances are very, very limited. That can be uncomfortable for some people. To it's a, it starts to feel claustrophobic. I see this most with like um, trails through parks and it's just buckthorn everywhere. So I'm like in a tunnel of buckthorn. I don't like it. I don't like how I can't see in advance. I, I can't see beyond that, that. Um, wall of green. I know it's buckthorn. So that also irritates me. The flip side is if you have these really big viewscapes um, and maybe, you know, this one is, is totally fine, but they're not always beautiful and lovely. And, you know, your neighbor's brush pile or, you know, um, backyard dump might be adjacent to the property near here. And, and this might be a, a disadvantage. And so one of the things that I do think it's important as the woodland owner or steward, you might have the decision-making authority to improve these sites, right? So if you are looking at the neighbor's dump, can you plant some vegetation to, to break up that sight line and sight distance? And, and the answer is probably Slope. I'm not going to go into this much in detail at all. Um, there's some great schematics in here. Slope matters. Like that is the absolute take home point. Um, it matters how you're going to get around up it. If you're going to go parallel to it, it's also going to matter in if and how you're going to need to cut the trail in order to get a tread that is even and that drains water. Again, we are in a wet place with a lot of water that that rains and it, it is in the landscape. And so we need to absolutely plan for water um, as, as we do these trails. And so this is an easy way to use a protractor in order to come up with um, your, your slope angles. It, it's not complicated, but I'm not gonna go into how to do that, um, but you need to do it. And so again, you're gonna sort of lay out your, your trail, then you're gonna do some of these calculations and then you're gonna strategize how to, to, to um, overcome and get through the obstacles and barriers. And then you have to think about how you're gonna level that trail. So trail radius, um, these are like two different ways to do that, right? So um, this is an example that Mel has on the left where you're trying to, to go down a very steep slope pretty quickly. You see these switchbacks all the time, um, but let's be really clear. These switchbacks are not gonna work for a cross country skier. Um, those are too tight. The turning radius is too tight. Uh, and then you can see these are heavily armored and heavily developed. Um, and so that is not by accident. Uh, on the right, here's an example where it's a much 
much more gentle turning radius. Uh, this is the picture that I kind of alluded to earlier where you can see that is also the burn line that is really common um, ar around my neck of the woods where it's common to have prairies that are burnt regularly, the trail which you wanna maintain so that you can have your burn edges and safely burn um, is very commonly the burn edge. And so if that's the case for you, if you wanna do prescribed burns in the woods or prairie res prairie burns, any, any kind of burns, you know, can you put in your trails in order to accommodate that land management um, while also meet, meeting these other goals and objectives? And, and uh, you often can, you just need to do that with good planning. So moving on, mark the trail. This is, I think, the fun part, right? Um, and I just want to say, I think, you can mark with flagging that's easy and inexpensive to get um, you mark it and then it's just flagging you know you're not m removing material you're not adding material you're not doing anything so you can mark it you can sort of practice it test it walk it a few times does it really meet your need where are your obstacles how can you overcome them and then once you feel really comfortable you might move your flags around while you're sorting that out but once you get really comfortable then it's time to get into um, preparing the tread, removing plant material, removing stones and rocks. Um, you, maybe do you need to bring in things? Do you need to move it around to get through wet areas, low spots, that, things like that. So this is the section where I'm not going into detail. I was told to talk for about 30 minutes and I'm there, um, but I'll just do a quick overview. So trail design, location clearing, tread construction, structure installation, and wayfinding. So Mel has tons and tons of great images of the tools that can be used to do clear, clear trail clearing. Um, and again, I'm happy to come back in a year and do that presentation, but there are many different ways. Mo for most woodland owners, these will be a number of and types of hand tools that will be used. It's relatively rare that you would bring in heavy equipment. I will say the exception to that is if you are going to have logging done and you want to put in any tra trails in conjunction with the logging, you can sometimes get um, a logger to do that. Uh, they may require some additional compensation because it's time and work on their equipment, but the equipment is there. The other way is you might be able to organize your um, skid trails, your log landings, and your access points in a way that you can then recycle them post-harvest, so things to think about. Um, but again, we have, I think, all of these different features in our landscape, and so um, to, to get through them requires some thought, and so uh, there's a whole section on that. Trail con construct the tread. So this is that part that you actually walk on. You really want to try to um, make sure that the compaction, like it, it's this funny thing, you, you need it to be compact. Um, so that's important. Maybe you don't always want it to be super compact depending on what you're doing. Uh, you may need to displace things for sure vegetation and that that first soil layer so you don't have any leaves on it. That really helps with drainage. And you need to make sure that you're managing for erosion. Um, typically, you want these to be really clear. This is a picture that, you know, they may not achieve that goal because of all the roots. So something to think about. Install structures to cross obstacles. So I've alluded to many, many obstacles. There's great schematics and diagrams about how to do these things. I'm saving this for another day. But even flatland, you still have to worry about water drainage. So like flatland can seem super easy, but if it gets super muddy, then maybe it's not easy anymore. Um, hills always require thought, often require some of these trail cuts, and then the fill is at the bottom is how that works. Are there any boulder fields that you need to tra transgress? Wetlands, super common, and particularly up in northern Minnesota. Streams, incredibly common in southeast Minnesota. And fences. So um, I've, I've had the privilege of hiking in Europe and New Zealand and many other places, and there are lots of creative ways to um, combine livestock and working farms with hiking trails and have fences that still do all their primary jobs um, and allow transgression across the landscape. So um, I don't, I think we don't commonly mix these things, but other places in the world do. And there's tons of ways in which you can have fences that still work to keep animals in or out um, and yet still enable people to relatively easily go through. So signs, um, this, if it's just you and your spouse or you and your immediate family, maybe you don't need any signs, um, but they can be fun. 
So this blowhole sign in the top right is from that Lost Creek hiking trail. And it's totally a fun feature. Like if I were the private woodland owner, and even if it was just my family, I may well sign that I have a blowhole on my property. Um, but, you know, maybe not. The So, you know, the ways that you typically do this are trail signs, confidence markers. So those can be, uh, these are really common, like paint sprayed on trees. Sometimes the reflective markers, you know, they could just be carrying the little rock piles that just make you feel certain that you're going the right way. And I think this matters the most in places where the trail might be a little harder to discern. And so the picture on the right, it's going over rock and, and it can be hard to discern a trail in those places. So then confidence markers that can be really helpful. We're very, I suspect all familiar with directional signs. So arrows, um, the sign, pl sign placards at the beginning, but warning signs can be really important in bluff country. Like people literally fall off of bluffs to their death. And so um, if that is the case, you would maybe want to sign that. And it, it may be beyond the sign, depending upon what you really have, but you want to be sure that it is safe. Okay, so I am um, in, in winding down and I will take questions very shortly. I just want to say that the DNR in 2007 came out with this really comprehensive book, Trail Planning, Design and Development Guidelines. It is for public trails. So municipal trails, county, state, um, and, and I think generally trails that are that are put in by professionals. So I share it with you because it is a very robust resource. And then I say it may be intimidating and more than you need. Um, and so know it, you have it in your back pocket, but um, you might want to start with the Woodland Stewardship Book. And then if you have questions, you can sort of hone in on those once you understand the language a little better and check out this resource. So with that, I think I am done. And so I will stop sharing. And I see there's some chat and questions. Angie, you can keep your if you want to keep sharing um, in case you have to go back on your slides, if you want. Sure. That's fine. And uh, for participants today, Lauren has put in some chat websites for you to reference that Angie gave her earlier. So if you haven't referenced those on your computer, you may want to do that. Uh, and then uh, we'll start with the questions. And Charlie and Emily, uh, you've been answering some of the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Charlie Blinn is on. And then... Uh, Emily uh, Dombeck is part of our forestry team as well. Um, let's see. Hey, Anna's what? on as well. Oh, Anna. Oh, good. Uh, Anna, thank you for joining us. Go ahead, Lauren. Uh, you can start with some of those questions unless okay. Charlie wants to answer some of the ones he's answered. But yeah, go ahead. Okay. First one, if you are trying to create a trail similar to the Lost Creek Trail, what is a good way to approach the conversation about public use by private land over owners, owners with neighbors? Yeah, I, it's a, I love that question. It's a really great one. So first I want to say, you know, how well do you know your neighbors, right? So you might need to like create a relationship with your neighbors and get to know them. And that might by itself take a little bit of time. Um, and then I think, I strongly suspect that you could reach out to the Lost Creek, the folks at the Lost Creek Trail and see if they would be willing to chat with your group. So the reason I say that is I find that there's often a lot of comfort in peers talking to peers. And so if you think you have even just one or two of your neighbors are willing to entertain this conversation, if you can en engage the Lost Creek Hiking Trail um, landowners, they've, they've had I mean, it has not been all kicks and giggles for them, right? I mean, there have been challenges and opportunities and they have figured out how to go forward, but they are a delightful group of woodland owners and they are rightfully so plow proud and pleased of their beautiful land, their land management. They do some really great forestry practices. They have these really beautiful natural features and they, I think, love the fact that they can share that with other people. Um, I will say, I don't know that that trail is super heavily used. Um, you know, if, if you hadn't heard of it today, you're probably not alone. I think a lot of people look to their county, their city and their states for recreational trails. And so my my point in sharing that is I don't know that you would be totally undated with, with people wanting to use it. But my first thing is reach out to your neighbors, make sure you have a good relationship with at least the core group. And then I strongly recommend you reach out to those folks at Lost Creek. And, and if you can't find a contact information on the website, circle back to me. Uh, I suspect I can make those connections. So um, that's what I would recommend. Okay, next one. Have you ha 
have you seen success with trail owners using signage to inform or discourage users from foraging? I'm thinking about wild ramps specifically. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, I don't, I have not seen any examples on private lands of people um, have, uh, of, of doing that. I have certainly heard of private woodland owners um, having trouble with poaching. And, and I think that poaching can include um, foraged plants. And so I, I will say that sci I think, um, I think signs can be really important, um, but they can be pros and cons, right? So if you say don't harvest the wild ramps, you're also saying, look, there are wild ramps here, right? So this is one of those examples, like, do you want to scream it or do you not want to say anything and hope people don't know how to identify them? Um, I will also say trail cams, super powerful tools these days, right? So if you're having a trouble, um, can you put a trail cam out there? Uh, and, and what to do with the information you might find, like that's maybe a whole nother series of questions that you should reflect upon. Um, but it, it turns out you can find lots of interesting things in the woods. I really enjoy the trail cams that I have out. And, um, and so I think that can also give you a little bit of insight on if it's one person or multiple people. And then if you know them, can you just approach them and say, hey, look, I know you've been out there. That's inappropriate. You know, if it's acceptable, you can use my land, you can hike, you can do these things, but you need to stay away from the foraging. Um, and that is absolutely your right. The other interesting part of that is, I mean, if they're trespassing, that's illegal, right? And so you would have proof of trespass. Again, whether you want to pursue that in a court of law is another series of questions you would need to ask. So I'm not sure I answered that question, but I gave it a go. Uh, next one. Is there a specific reason why a property owner would want to build and maintain a public trail? Wondering what the advantages are since I can see wear and tear on the trail requiring lots of maintenance. Yeah, it's a good question. And I don't know that there's a specific advantage to the woodland owner, right? So I think that group in the Lost Creek Hiking Trail, I think they, they wanted to do it. I mean, that's the deal right? Um, they felt like they had a lot to share and they wanted to do it. I think they like it. I think they like the collaboration and the collegiality. I think they like the fact that they have this great group of adjacent neighbors that they see and they um, get to engage with in a, in a different way. Um, but I don't know beyond that, that they, I am unaware, for example, that they try to engage those users to do work on the trail. I've never, I've never seen that. Um, and so, no, I don't know that there is a specific advantage other than they get to share this property that they love with others. And then how do you find someone to hire to help design my trails? Yeah, I don't know that I have a good answer for that. I'll be really honest. Um, I have not looked. So if someone else amongst my colleagues knows a better answer, then then please drop that in. I will tell you the the professionals that I am most familiar with, I think commonly do trail work on public lands. So if you want to engage those, I would say there are definitely consultants that you like your city might work with or your county or your township um, that they might have engaged to do that. I don't know if their costs might be prohibited for you, prohibitive for you. I do know, I mean, I, I, I know Mel Bauman, who was the founder of this presentation, and I had um, I've, I've been able to keep in touch with him and was out on a trail that he maintains over the summer with him. And it was really lovely. But I know there was a period of time where he um, did that service for people. And he, he I don't think he does it anymore. So it, it could be a niche that we don't have a lot of professional capacity for, unless my colleagues know more. Another resource on that might be the Minnesota DNR, maybe state parks, uh, co contractors that they Higher yeah. for public trails and so forth that 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 do private trails that might be a, another offer that you contact your local state park that's close to you and then see what they have for contractors that do trails. Any other okay. questions, Laura? Um, I think there's one other question here, and then there's a couple. There's like a resource somebody mentioned. Um, this question is DNR slash Fishing and Wildlife NRCS has matching funds for whoop, landowners who have a formal stewardship plan. How do recreational trails qualify for this? Do birding trails, ski trails, bike trails qualify? 
I do not know that they do. I'm going to sort of scary. Anybody else on the call have an answer to that? I'm not sure they do. And I, I suspect I, I could be wrong. So if I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, but I suspect they're not considered public goods. And so um, that there may be resistant from public funders to fund them. Now, if you were to have public access, then maybe you could apply for some trail grants or something like that. But if it's, I don't want to say just because I think they have value, but if it is for your use and your consumption, I don't know that many of the grants would be willing to fund that. Um, unlike when you put in a wildlife pond or a food plot or you do um, buckthorn removal or even good sound forestry, we know that those all have tertiary benefits to the environment as a whole and the community as a whole and the citizens of the state and the nation. And so those get public funding in a way that I don't know that recreational trails would. Again, if I'm wrong, someone drop in that link. Looks like Kate, Kate has addressed that uh, down below. Let's see. Um, I can answer that NRCS question. It's combined with other access grants for wildlife habitat creation. So contact NRCS or DNR or whoever the source of that funding is, and, and they should answer that question for you. Thank you, Kate. That was great. Uh, another couple questions popped in. Um, do you have any resources concerning how to address mosquitoes and ticks along the trails? Ooh, that's a good one. So um, uh, resources, I bet we can dig some up. Maybe one of my colleagues can do that. I will say, um, uh, so for tick management in general, there can be Im important things to remember. One, you want to be tick aware all the time. The woodlands are the place where ticks are most likely to be present. Um, and so I've seen recommendations from tick experts where they say have a delineation when you enter a woodland so that like psychologically you remember now I need to be looking for ticks um, or I need to pull my socks and tuck in my pants or I need to make sure that I do a, a thorough tick check when I exit. I would imagine for the trails um, to this audience, they're all going to go through the woods. So, you know, this might be something that you do at the very beginning of the trail. And then at the end, as a reminder to do those tick checks, um, you can do vegetative management that will improve that will reduce ticks in particular. So we know that Japanese barberry, for example, an invasive plant can increase um, tick populations and those ticks have a lot of tick-borne diseases in them. And so absolutely get rid of uh, buck barberry. I would, I would say as a terrestrial invasive species specialist, like please get rid of invasive species when and where you can generally, uh, but barberry in particular is a problem. So if you are in an area, which is mostly the far Southeast corner of Minnesota with barberry, get rid of it and that will decrease your tech population. Um, let's see the other thing. So mosquitoes was the other thing. So um, <laughs> in our many and well-watered landscape, they do have a lot of really great natural habitat. So I don't, I don't think we have any great solutions for that. Um, but of course you can minimize uh, their habitat by not leaving things out that hold water because that standing water is tick breeding area, but swamps, marshes, lakes, those are all doing the same thing. So I don't think I have any super great feedback on how to manage mosquitoes. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Gary, that we have a, a Friday with the Forester coming up on uh, April 19th that is specifically about ticks and mosquitoes and how to deal with them and the issues that they might um, present. And so I'm guessing that this question is a plant from our speaker on April 19th. <laughs> Yay! I'm Good kidding. job. Probably not. But I think that's very, it's very prescient. So, uh, so hopefully we'll see you all back here on April 19th. Thank you, Emily. That's what I was just I was gonna say, April 19th, ticks and mosquitoes. Okay, another question. Are there any native plants that will compete with poison ivy along the trails? Oh, that's a good that's a good one. Um, so uh yes, I would say, but um then, then the details matter. So I'm gonna give a shout out for our brand new or very new climate ready woodlands, a tree and plant list. So if somebody wants to drop that great resource into the chat, that would be super awesome. Um and so there are certainly plants. So poison ivy is a disturbance species. So you you see it on trails and campgrounds because they're they're high utilization disturbance areas. Um, but that's very much in line with its ecosystem niche. And so um, 
this is tricky, right? So it likes disturbance. Trails are generally considered um, areas of disturbance. So that's why you see them side by side. Uh, so the once you get your trail established, so uh, there may be a period of time where you're going to need to sort of work to really mitigate this. But then over time, it may go away or become much less of an issue. And so sort of to recognize this might be a, a journey that you're on. So when you first establish the trail, if there's already poison ivy present, I would say it's probably likely that you're going to see the poison ivy sort of grow and mature. Now, it could be very reasonable and plausible to put down seeds, or if it's a really important area, even to put down some other um, native plants that, that um, are likely to be I would say aggressive if that's what you want, right? So that are likely to really thrive in that space and then they can potentially outcompete poison ivy. And so we see that a lot. I mean, there isn't poison ivy all throughout the woods. It tends to be concentrated in these areas of, of um, disturbance. And so hopefully somebody dropped in the climate ready woods. There are tons of species on that list and they may not, they certainly are not all appropriate for full shade or, you know, but, but there are lots of species, some of which are considered um, weedy or aggressive, uh, which I, I would like to reframe as climate resilient. Um, but but to each their own. And so I would recommend you look at that and see, are there some other understory species that will that will um, work in that niche and then go ahead and prioritize those and see if they you can get them established out compete poison ivy. And I see one other question here. What are the common biggest regrets among private owners once they have built their trails, layout, design flaws, drainage, et cetera? Well, oh, it's a super great question that I just do not feel like I have enough data to, to know the answer to. So I apologize. Um, if people have them, though, and they want to either email me or drop in their experiences in the chat, we could start to potentially gather that data. It's a great question, and I don't, I don't know the answer to it. I think the rest of these are resources. Somebody dropped um, at American Trails. There's a link for that. Um, Professional Trail Builders Association, there's a link for that one. PTBA Professional Trail Building Association has a list of folks who work with public entities, but also work with private landowners. Um, and then the last one is, this is specific to mountain biking. There is a fairly recent Minnesota book from 2023 that was published by the Greater Minnesota Region Parks and Trails Commission titled Mountain Bike Trail Development Guidelines for Successfully Managing the Process, which can be found here. And there's a link for that as well. Yeah, thanks. I've heard a lot about that new mountain biking guide in particular. Um, it is very specific to mountain biking. So if that's not your groove, you probably don't really care. But it is brand new, hot off the presses in 2023. Um, and I do think it really talks through some of the important issues. It, it, it covers, I think, all things related to mountain biking. But um, mountain biking has, so it, it can have some more erosion impacts than some other uses. Um, and so I think it talks through those pretty thoroughly. Thank you, Josh, for all those uh, recommendations for websites or resources. That's wonderful. And Angie, you can stop sharing and I'll get to our final segment. Lauren, I'd like to thank our staff too, uh, Emily, Anna, Lauren, and and uh, Angie for presenting today. Holy cow, uh, great topic. I think we had 169 people join us today. Uh, there's Angie's email if you want to email Angie. Again, all of our recordings are recorded on a Z link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. Just wanted to reinforce our remaining uh, types of topics that we're going to be covering on Fridays with a Forester. Next week will be birds. Uh, forestry of Minnesota birds. And then Emily reminded us about the ticks and mosquitoes April 19th. We're probably, in fact, I've even heard of uh, ticks being reported already uh, in Minnesota, but uh, it might be a little late in the season, but it'd be great to talk with the people from the Department of Health and talking about the health requirements and health uh, problems with ticks and mosquitoes around Minnesota. Uh, as you, have, you leave our Zoom today, uh, you will be given an opportunity for an evaluation. We'd like to for you to fill that out. It's certainly anonymous, but we like your comments about today's webinar and maybe future webinars you'd like to uh, listen to and watch. Here's some references. Again, uh, all of our recordings are going to be recorded on zlink, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. 
And again, if you want to belong to our uh, webinar or our news release, excuse me, our uh, newsletter, our Minnesota uh, WIDS uh, newsletter, it comes out once a month. Uh, you can access that with the Z links there on the screen. Thanks for attending today's webinar.